you're sitting at home at night, and there's a, a knock at the door. And as you look out through the, the peephole there, you recognize the person. Uh, you're not friends, not close friends with the person, but you know them. Uh, they, they've been coming to church some lately that, uh, at church you attend. and So you know them, so you feel comfortable opening the door. And they come in, and you can tell by their face, they're just carrying the weight of the world. And you begin to talk, and they start telling and explaining to you that some things are happening in their life. That it's just like things are just coming unraveled. Everything that they thought they could count on and just uh, had the foundation in life, was they didn't even question it. Everything was good. But now, now their, their world, they just don't know what's right. They don't know what's the up and down. It's, everything's in turmoil. And you have the opportunity to talk to them a little bit about Jesus. And so you share what those life-giving words of Jesus have. That's what's got them in turmoil. Now they're what they've always thought and accepted. But now that Jesus has been intermingled into this and they're hearing his teachings, they're just confused. And you get the chance to talk to them about Jesus Christ and the gospel and being saved. Well, that night comes to an end and they listen, but they leave. And you do not know whether... They took to heart the things that you said. But they still listened and they left. You know, Jesus had an encounter pretty much like that one. I said imagine it, but Jesus really did have an encounter like that. One night a man came to, his, came to him at night and asked him some questions. In John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says this. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, uh, he has been taught the, the Word of God his whole life. Everything on the outside would look like it's all together. He's a leader of people, is respected. Uh, if anybody has their life together, it would be Nicodemus. But then he begins to hear this Jesus. And everything is starting to just be the turmoil in his mind and in his soul because he knows what he has believed his whole life, but now Jesus is teaching different things, and he just doesn't know what to think. And so he comes to Jesus and begins to ask questions, and you really should read the whole chapter. But he asks Jesus questions, and I, I, I feel bad for Nicodemus to start with. Jesus answers back the first one and says, you must be born again. That clears everything up, doesn't it? And he tells, and Nicodemus ask more questions and Jesus tells him more and that's why I say you really need to read it but it comes to a place there where Jesus says this in John 3 16 and 17 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him we are heading into a season, and I'm not talking about weather because we have all four seasons every week, you know? <laughs> about 50 degree <laughs> swinging temperature every week. I'm talking about the season of Easter, where everything seems to be, you know, it's just heading towards Easter Sunday. And that's just three more Sundays away from today, the Easter. And, and you know, and a lot of times we'd say, well, don't the things that we celebrate at Easter in the church... Don't we celebrate those same things every week? You are 100% right. Every time we come together, our focus is on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what Easter is about. But Easter allows us to just to be, uh, it just goes to another level. We're able to focus on some things and, and dive into some things that, that's very important to us. And that's why we are doing this sermon series that, that, we call, that we're calling Passion. If you look at the definition of passion, it is an intense desire and enthusiasm for something or someone. And if you look under the religious part of the definition, it says the passion of the Christ. 
And it's that period from the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper to his death. And that's called the Passion. And on her screen, if you can, if you got good eyes, you can see the little small tagline that's there. It wasn't the nails. It wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It wasn't the soldiers there enforcing it. It wasn't the Jewish ruling council who found him guilty. It wasn't Pilate who said, you can crucify him. It was his love. That's what we're going to see. It was his love that held him to the cross. It was a commitment to the plan, the purpose of him coming. And he knew he would fulfill it because his love for the Father and his love for us. And as we're going to look at John 3.16 a little deeper, just a couple of phrases, I want you to notice this first one. It's just simply this, God so loved the world. First thing, God loved the world. If you were to do a man-on-the-street interview and you were to go out and have the microphone and just stop people going into a store and ask them, describe God. What do you think about when you, when you think of God? You'd get a lot of different answers. Some of them flattering and some of them not very flattering. Some very accurate, some very inaccurate. But I believe that the majority of the answers you would get would involve the love of God. That God is love. I mean, actually, the Bible says that. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. That's a powerful statement to say God is love. This week, I attended, attended or had part in three funerals this week. And all three, a preacher, a son, grandsons, all told about the person that had passed away. They gave a description of the person. Isn't that what we do? We talk about the person. We tell what a, a good person they were, that they, how much they loved us and things like that. And I got to hear grandsons and sons talk about things like that this week. That's what we do. To talk about the person, we want to describe the person. And that's part of that. And I think that's, that's, that's great. And this is a description of God. Somebody asks you, say, well, God is love. He's all about love. The Greek language in which the Bible was written originally, the New Testament originally written, is a very specific language. Where we have one word for love, it has four. And in this case where it talks that God so loved the world, it uses the highest form of love. The one that is willful, pure, and sacrificial. It's the agape love. It is a love out of choice. I choose to love. It's not out of obligation or attraction. I choose. And this is important because when you understand that God so loved the world, and that's the agape love, he is choosing to love us. It is not something that we do that attracts God's love. This, cha this can change it, it can change your whole outlook about God and about yourself to realize that God loves you for who you are. He sees us as, as my mom used to say, he sees us warts and all. He sees everything. David Price years ago, years ago told about a, a family in his church who had adopted a young, uh, a young girl from another country, and it was a horrific situation. The, orphanage that they, they were able to adopt her from in this foreign country was terrible. And she was brought to the United States. And uh, one of the things that they told her is they're teaching her responsibility was this, now this is your room, but you have to keep it clean. You have to keep it straight. And she fixated on that. So every morning when her parents, one of her parents or both of them would come in to wake her up in the morning, she would be awake and a room would be clean, and the bed would be made. You can tell this is an American children we're talking about, right? <laughs> but everything would be spotless. And she would say, my room is clean. Can I stay? Do you still love me? And it broke their hearts that she had equated that she needed to perform this way for them to to consider her part of the family and to let her stay. And through, through time and reinforcing what love really is, 
they, they were able to teach her that she was a loved member of that family. But this was just responsibilities. And with time, she learned that discipline and responsibility uh, didn't mean that someone didn't love you. When we grasp this idea that God loves us, period, it's, it can be life-changing. You know from many stories that I tell that I enjoy movies. I, I, I get a lot out of movies. How many of you saw the movies Taken, the Taken series? You know, you know the, the first one especially was the best one, usually is. But in that movie, for those of you that, that not sh- are not aware of what the plot was, this man's daughter uh, is kidnapped on a school trip to France, a uh, trip with her friends, and she is kidnapped. And in the process, she gets the opportunity to call her dad and say, tell him what's happening. And uh, he tells her, he says, they are going to take you. But he tells her, I want you to pay attention and all these things and describe all this to me. And he says this to her. He said, they will take you. He says, but I will come for you. I will find you. And the movie then is all about his, his trying to get to France to find where they are. And he does anything. He does anything to save his daughter. And my favorite scene is there right at the end of the movie where she, uh, he finally comes in and it's a man with a, a knife to her throat and he kills him. And as he falls dead, the daughter just falls apart crying. And she falls into her father's arm and she says, you came for me. And he says, I told you I would. If that's not the gospel, if that's not what Jesus said, if that's not what God's plan is that I know sin is going to take you, but I'm going to come for you. I told you I would. When we grasp that idea that God loves us so much that he would do that, it can be life-changing. The second thing I want us to focus on here in this, this one short verse is that God sent his son. You can tell me you love me, but you got to show me you love me. Uh, you got to, you got to show love. How God showed his love is how we know what love is. Look at 1 John 4, 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's first John he's writing this. You see, love must be shown so that it can be known. Love has to be shown so that people know that it is that you love them. Love creates a passion deep within us. When I was probably about 12 years old and up, I thought one of the greatest inventions and discovery in time was to realize you could have a balloon and fill it with water. And then, therefore, you threw it at something or someone. And I remember just one summer, that's all we wanted to do, the boys in the neighborhood. And one time we had our, the wagon just full of water balloons, and we went out by the road, and we would stand there just like we were minding our own business. When a car would come, we would unload on the car. I mean, we were multiple, plow, 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 hitting cars. And it was wonderful to show you how smart we were. We had not thought about what if a car stops after you've nailed them. And sure enough, there was this pickup truck come by, and I mean, we unloaded, and I mean, the water balloons hitting, but there was one. You remember the trucks when you had the side vent window that it would crank out, you know? <laughs> one hit just right into that window part, and so, and so it just, you tell, just exploded inside of the truck. And he slammed on the brakes and come to a screeching halt, and we were like, we hadn't thought about this. We didn't have a plan B. So we just take off running, and we're running, and we ran around behind my house and went in the basement. 
And we're in the basement. We're saying, well, we're hiding. And we hear on the front door, boom, 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 boom. Like pounding on our front door. And my dad was there, and he answered the door, and we could hear the man. You know, he was telling what, it, what we had done, and he wanted us. He wanted us. And I can remember just down there scared to death, and I'm hearing my dad telling this, this gentleman, that's never going to happen. He didn't think too much of this man's plan. And he told him to hit the road. He used some more flowery language. <laughs> and, I've, and, and I've told you before, my dad was not dad of the year, but he had his moments, and that was one of them. To this day, I can see, still see that and hear that. That he was not going to let someone take his child away. That he would deal with what needed to be dealt with, but no one else. 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. When someone like my dad did defended me when I'm in the wrong, when I'm not at the best, when I'm at my most vulnerable, that goes a long way. And that's exactly what we see that God did. Writer and musician by the name, a writer and musician by the name of Frederick Lehman was touched by a sermon that he heard the night before at a church that a preacher had preached on the love of God. And this so captured Frederick Lehman's mind that when he got home, he couldn't even sleep that night. He began just to write about the love of God, and he wanted to write a poem. And he, so he began to write, and it worked the next day on scraps of paper as he, things would think about it. Uh, he would write them down. And for those of you that... Uh, been, are old enough like me that we sang from the hymn book and sang so many old songs. Remember the song, The Love of God. He wrote this and put the music to him himself, and that first verse goes like this. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. But the third verse is my favorite. I think that's the one that captures everything. He says this, Could we with ink the ocean fill? We could fill up the ocean with ink. And were the skies of parchment made, if they were made out of paper, were every, st were every stalk on earth a quill, a writing instrument, and every man a scribe by trade, and everybody could write. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the hole that stretched from sky to sky. That you could take everything and everyone, and we write down everything we could about God, the sky wouldn't hold it. This was a man that was captured by the love of God and the thought and the idea of it. And that's what we spend the rest of our lives hopefully doing, is being changed by the love of God. Jesus spent a good portion of his time with his disciples, teaching them about the love of God, teaching them about love, how to show love to other people. He went as far as saying things like, uh, in John 13, he said, A new command I give you, love one another. And as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus says, this will be your calling card. This is how people are going to know that you've been with Jesus. Because you'll love like I loved people. And he tells them, he says, there are going to be people that's going to be hard to love. Anybody got any of those? Don't raise your hand. Hard to love people. He says, doesn't matter. Love them. He says, it's going to be times when love causes you to sacrifice a great deal. 
Jesus told him, he said, if you have two coats and someone's cold, you give the other one your coat. You give one away. Someone does you wrong, love them. Love them. Do you love them? Forgive them seven times? Jesus says, no. Seventy times seven. You keep forgiving. That culture of that day is no different than our culture of today that says, when someone does us wrong, we cancel the person. Jesus said, cancel the debt, not the person. He tells us to make things right. As far as it depends on you, you do what you can to make things right with people. He says we are to put others first. You love other people more than we love ourselves. Put them first in life. And that's just some of the things that Jesus taught about loving like him. You know, we have a lot to consider today. We have a lot to think about, don't we? When you can describe love that way. My hope is that some of us will go home just like Frederick Lehman did. And just be engulfed and taken in by what the love of God means. And begin to think and ponder on that. Not to give up on God's love until it changes us. If we don't, then we're the, we're the ones who have lost. You see, God has already given his love. He's already shown it through his son. But if we don't accept it, if we don't receive it and do something with that love, then we lose that love. A gift given is not a gift received until we take it. We began this, began this message this morning by talking about Nicodemus, a man named Nicodemus. That night, if you go back and read there, John 3, Jesus shares these things. He, he shares the words with him. He talks to him. But it does not tell us what Nicodemus does. It doesn't say that he became a follower. But a few chapters later, in chapter 7 of John, we see that the Pharisees, the ruling council, are talking about Jesus. What are we going to do with this man? And Nicodemus speaks up and he says, Are we in the habit of convicting somebody, finding them guilty without listening to them? So he speaks up and says, We need to listen to this man. And they turn on him and say, what, are you a follower of him now? Still it doesn't tell us if he became a follower. But we go further and further towards the end of the book of John. Jesus has been arrested. He has been crucified. He has died. Remember, his fa they allowed his, his friends and family to take him down from the cross to take his body to prepare for burial. They're going to bury him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. But there's a name mentioned there. Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus in the night, was there too. And it says he took, they embalmed or embalmed Jesus' body, what they, that's how they embalmed it, by packing and covering them with spices for the smell. And it says specifically there were 75 pounds. Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of the spices. And I've read that over my whole life. Never thought a thing about it. I read one thing today, or this week, that said that amount of spices was what was fit for a king, not just the average Joe. It doesn't tell us Nicodemus was a follower. But what do you think? I think from that night, that Jesus talked to him about the love of God that he began. And in the end, he called him his king. 